Central Club. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome Mr. Teddy Stone. Is that a drum roll? <laughs> <laughs> it's Teddy Stone. Yeah. What's happening? Yeah, good, good. Thank you for coming. No, we've been trying to get get this on for quite a while now. Yeah. So um, I'm glad we finally managed to get together. Yeah, well, I, I was I was quite surprised that you're in Cardiff this weekend, and we've come yeah. to London, and I thought well, he's in Cardiff. To be to be honest, that was a last minute yeah. thing, you know, um, which is tied in with uh, with this vodka brand that I'm involved in uh, called Ne10, um, which um, yeah, we're going to be putting together like a tour of all the clubs in. Uh, and, you know, I'm going back to, uh, oh, look, it's lit, lighting up. Press the button. <laughs> um, that, you know what? Like, it looks like a smart bottle, like it's like smartly made and stuff. Well, it, look, it looks good. It's multi-purpose. You can use it as a torch to find your way home. <laughs> <laughs> it lights up. It lights up. That's um, a good idea. It lights up your glasses in the club when you've had a few drinks, you can see it. Um, but it's, it's actually really, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually. Taste-wise. It's distilled in, in Wales which is, you know, on your doorstep, you know. Only, only the best. Um, but obviously, you know, it's, it's a British premium vodka, five times distilled. It's made with a grey goose grain, but they do a few little bits to it to make it taste slightly better. But, um, you know, that's the fastest growing premium vodka, you know, this year, you know, that's just been launched. Yeah, so, from being launched. Um, and Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, my, my, my friend contacted me three years ago and said, you know, I'm going to come up with a really good idea. I'm going to have this light-up bolt. It's going to be metallic. It's going to be this, it's going to be that. I was like, great. And he goes, you know, I want you to be involved, blah, blah, blah. And then didn't really speak to him about it again. And then he pops up and goes, oh, we're, we're ready to go now. Wow. I was like, fantastic. So, you know, it's, it's 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 an interesting business. It's something that I've not been involved in before. Um, but, you know, I'm a fast learner. So um, I've learned. Yes, you and, are. And, 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 you know, most people um, that I speak to like vodka. So, you know, it's very easy to – and people always say – any ten is that northeast London? Is it Newcastle? And it actually doesn't mean any of that. It was, um, it was literally the guy said, um, you know, you know, you, obviously you could call it light up vodka or or the light vodka, but he said actually it's more neony. So he yes. said actually I want to call it neon vodka, and then it was like, well, you know, neon vodka it sounds a bit gimmicky and a bit cheesy. So he said, you know, what I wonder what neon is on the periodic table, and he looked it up and it was any ten. So he said, look, we will call it any ten. And if people from Newcastle want to think it's for them, it can be for them. If people in North, <laughs> North East London, East London yeah. it's for them. So anyone in any tent, it's for you. But if you live outside yeah. any tent, it's also for you. <laughs> it's also for you. Now, like I said, it, there's a lot of tatty bottles out there you see. And they, people really try to, you know, be different with their bottles. But well, I think I think the problem with, with um, you know, with premium products is if you're going to do a premium vodka, and then you're going to spin out flavours. So at the moment, we've got obviously just a standard vodka, but then we've got um, blue raspberry and we've also got um, pink apple, right? Which is mad because it's actually pink and blue, the, the vodka. So when you pour it out, is it, it looks like, yeah, it looks yeah. like a slush puppy. <laughs> so I'm sure people will be getting crushed yeah, and making it up. Yeah, yeah, their yeah. alcoholic slush puppies with it. But we've got um, a uh, peach, which would be like in a rose gold bottle, and then we've got a black cherry coming out as well. So we've got some interesting flavours coming. And, um, you know, all of the flavoured vodkas that we do are 40% proof, which means they are premium flavoured vodka. A lot of people that do flavoured vodkas, um, they don't actually make it with 40%, which means it's cheaper, but um, obviously, you know, it, it, it's not the same quality. So so you just said you was a fast learner, yeah? Yeah. And, and, and and it seems that's where you come across as me, as someone who can just, you know, kind of, you know, where's the money at type of thing? What, what's the next graph type of thing? And that's to, how you've gone along. To be honest, like for me, um, the one thing that I've I learned from being brought up on a council estate with no money and working at McDonald's as my first job, you know, I think if you start at the bottom um, and you've got no qualifications, the only thing you can really do is give it your all. And if you fall over or if you fail or if you lose, you have to get up and you have to go again. And when I used to box, that was a big, big lesson. You know, you don't give up. You know, you've got to carry me out of here to, you know, stop me do you know what i mean yeah. i think that yeah. that was re that really is life you know you 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 know some people just focus on one thing um but you know you look at some of the most famous people and some of the most richest people in the world you know steve jobs right he, he invented the apple computer in his garage right everyone probably thought he was nuts they probably thought look at the geek in the garage doing his 
yeah, and computer. Yeah, Who's going to buy that? And then obviously it ended up becoming a trillion dollar company. Yeah. Look at um, Dyson. You know, he he um, he he invented. You know, everyone Hoover. goes, "Oh yeah, he's the Hoover man." He's but, not. But he actually said in one of his quotes, which is amazing, James Dyson said, "You know, I've had forty nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine failures, and I've got one hit." And he goes, that's all I needed. So that really is a lesson that, you know, people just see him and go, oh, look, he's a billionaire. Oh, look, you know, he's he's really smart. He's invented the Hoover. But I haven't seen all the, the, all the crap the and all the aggravation. And it's the same with me, you know. Um, I make a film, it works. I make a film, it doesn't work. You know, you go through your career. As an actor, same thing. You're in a TV show, it's great. You're in a TV show, it's bad. You're in a film, it's great. You're in a film, it's bad. You know, you look at, you know, um, and, and Michael Caine was was a great, uh, great, great. He said something really funny. He said, um, he said, you know, he said, some of my jobs, I do it for the money. Um, and some of it, I do it for the art. Um, and, and, and then, which is basically like, you know, anything I've done that's not that great, I do it for the money. But it's probably not true. But people say yeah, that because they, good- nobody, nobody really wants to, you know, nobody likes to be in anything that's not successful. But I think in life, if you hit every single thing you did and was a success, you, you know, you'd be a billionaire and you'd be sort of thinking, what's the point of being alive? Everything I do works. Yeah, it's always you know, sweeter and with the with And, the and, and you know, I think you actually learn more from challenges, more from failure than you do if you get it right all the time. Because if you get it right all the time, you become complacent, you get carried away, you start believing your own bullshit. And I think you have to get your feet on the floor and be humble yeah. and, you know, give thanks and, and be respectful to people that, you know, have helped you out or put you where you are, you know. Yeah, I, to- I totally agree, mate. And I think, you know, maybe true to your words here because you, you are easy to contact. You know, you, you're not someone who would just like, you know, ignore. there's a lot of people out there who are like that, like, do you know what I mean? And I get that, that kind of vibe off you that you are the type of person who has got his feet firmly on the ground. Yeah, and- thought we do a film premiere, right? And we have a thousand people there and people want to have a picture, people want to talk to me, I'll talk to them. By the end of the night, I am sick of talking to people and sick of having pictures with people because obviously, like, you're worn out, right? But the thing is, I don't ever complain about it because I just think these people um, are following me for whatever reason. You know, they're supporting me for whatever reason. And I like what I do for whatever reason. So if they want a picture or they want to talk to me, I'm not going to be rude to them or, you know, no, you know, I'm too important to have a picture or I'm not going to talk to you because I'm busy. You know, I just think it's part of the game, you know, and it's that thing where, you know, if you're doing something that involves you being an influencer or an actor or a celebrity or whatever you want to call it, I think you just have to be respectful of people because, yeah. you know, if you act like an ass, and we've had it on films, I won't name any names, but we've had actors that have been a pain in the ass. We've had people coming on the set out of their brains and we've just said to them, look, guys, we're working here. This ain't the place to do this, you know what I mean? But... Unfortunately, I think the the problem with um, you know t- television and film is you do get these characters that um, you know either have a drinks problem or a drugs problem, or they have an ego problem, and you know they get carried away with it all. You know, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I'm actually, know. everyone always says to me, <laughs> "You're really easy to deal with." You know what I mean? Because you know, I'm actually if someone rings me up and gives me a job, and I'm actually on a film set working. I'm actually over the moon because I'm getting paid to do something I love. You know, it's not like I'm I'm having to dig mm. holes in the road at three in the morning or yeah, that's what people don't sweep understand. up rubbish or, you know, build, you know, I've done all these jobs, by the way. Yeah. But, you know, I remember somebody gave me a job once. I had a three-week contract in a car park putting together plastic bins, right? <laughs> right? And it was like you get there at eight in the morning, you go, go home at six at night. Do yeah. you know what I mean? But you're yeah. getting like, I don't know what it was then. Right? It was, was not great. Not, not particularly great money. It wasn't life changing money. But I was like, great, I'm getting paid. Mm. And, you know, I'm going to make these bins. And um, at the end of it, I went home and I was like, oh, you know, what am I going to do now? Oh, and then and then somebody rang out, oh, you can be a dustman for a few weeks. You know what I mean? So and I was a dustman. You know, I've done whatever job you think is bad, I've done. You find Every, that with a lot of successful people who are. But, but you, know, you know you what? Have it, to try I, tell everything. What it, I tell you what it's taught me, right, in life. He's taught me that, and, and I remember when I worked in McDonald's, you know, I, it was my first proper job, right? And what it taught me was you have to work as a team. You have to learn the stuff. You have to be disciplined. And one of their opening lines was, may I help you, please? 
And I thought about it and I was thinking, it really annoys me every time I say this. My happy piece. Because it's not really sincere. It's just like, you've got to say it. My happy piece. But if you think about it, it's so polite. You know, you're in a burger joint. My happy piece. Thanks again. Please call again. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's, it's that thing where you're just treating people well. And then, you know, you, 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 you have to clean the toilets. You have to, you know, cook the fries. You have to carry the boxes. You have to walk up and down the high street picking the litter up. You know, so I think if you can do that, you can do anything and nothing is ever beneath you. You know what I mean? And I mm. think, I think boxing and working at McDonald's and it sounds crazy, but those two things, and I used to do long distance running like marathons and half marathons and those three disciplines set me up really for business because, um, you know, the boxing is about, you know, if you don't train, if you don't, if you're not disciplined, you're going to get beaten up. And when you're <laughs> running, if you stop, you're not going to, so you've got to keep going. You know what I mean? Even though when you hit that wall and you go, I can't run anymore. You just got to push through it. You know mm. what I mean? And and the McDonald's thing was all about, um, you know, yeah. whatever you, you whatever you need to do, whatever to make this work. Right, you're part of the team. So if you're a good boy and you make it work, you get a star. And if you're a good boy on all these things, you get five stars. And if you're a really good boy, you get a white badge and a shirt. You take the city hat off yeah, yeah, and the brown yeah. flares, and and, and be a manager. So for somebody who, like me, was uneducated really because I didn't have any qualifications. Mm. You could go to McDonald's and you could start off cooking fries or sweeping the floor. And you could be the managing director if yeah. you want to put the out. I saw a film coming to America when he's in McDowell's and he goes, last year I was on the brush. What was it? Last year I was on the sweeping. This year I'm on the deep fryer. And <laughs> next year, baby, I'm on the big bucks. But, yeah. but, you know, that's, that's what that, it is, man. But, but, you know, it's like retail. My dad, you know, he, uh, he worked in Tesco's. He was a butcher. And then he went from being a butcher to being – the assistant manager of the meat department. Then he was the manager. Then he went to the assistant manager of the store. Then he became the manager of the store. Then he was the regional manager. Then he was the area manager. So, you know, you can, you know, if you, I mean, look, some people don't want to work in a corporate environment and work their way out. They want to do their own business. Mm. Um, I, I think I, I think I'd be, the, the things that I'd be good at is I'd be good at sales and I'd be good at anything to do with people, right? Cause I do normally get on with pretty much mm. everybody unless they're complete and utter cunts. <laughs> You can't. <laughs> you can't. Um, but um, yeah, no. I, I like to say that word because lots of people like it. They love it. But, it, it, it is. It's, but, do your own like ASMR. <laughs> What's the one called? Uh, uh, not not TikTok. The one where you can get like requests in off people. Are you on that? Cameo. Cameo. Yeah. He knows already. Do you know what's really funny? Like somebody said to me, oh, you should be on Cameo. Loads of people like you as this character. Happy birthday, you can I don't get any any requests saying, oh, can you be nice to anybody? It's, oh, can you... Can you abuse my friend? Can you call him a cunt? Can you, can you, can you, can you call him a low life? Can you tell him you're going to come in and do him and all this? Yeah. And it's just like stupid shit, but it's funny. You know what I mean? And I think yeah. if these people, and these are people that are die foot soldier fans. So for me, it's a way of interacting and giving yeah. people that like my character something back. And you know, in COVID, you know, I had lots of people, I had two, 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 uh, I think they were like 18, 19 year old boys and their mum was a nurse on the NHS. And I sent me a message. I said, look, my mum loves Rise of the Foot Soldier. She loves your character. And she's on the front line and, you know, she's like working. You now they worked some really hard, the nurses in, in COVID. And she actually said, you know, um, I, I, you know, I want to get her a message. Yeah, yeah. Um, to just sort of, you know, basically wish her well and all this fit. So I was just like, and I can't even remember what her name was, but it was like, listen, darling, I know you like a bit of Tony Tucker. Right, and when you finish after your shift, I'll be waiting for you. Um, I want to, I want to give you a big cuddle and say your kids are so proud of you, um, and That's I'm proud nice. of you. Do you know what I mean? And for me, I was thinking this is actually something good because she's going to come home from like being working 14 hours, 18 hours, whatever it is, and she's going to put that on and she's going to go. Oh my God! You know my kids have done that for me, and and that's the guy wishing me telling you know, and it's just something yeah, small, yeah. but you know, for, for oh, it's that, massive like, for people. That massive. Giving her a massive boost, and obviously, if you're a foot soldier fan. And you got Pat Tate or Tony Tucker calling your cunt, you know, it's probably a great birthday gift. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it certainly is. There's um this there's, there's something I want to go into. Uh it's it's it's, it's about your early career still. Right. Um, because it's funny, you've just spoken about like I've never had my own alcohol, never thought about it, you know, before. But you was heavily involved in in the rave scene, which includes obviously a lot of alcohol, probably more water actually. Yeah, you know what the, days, the rave but... scene was, you know, it was it was a water thing, it was literally you know that they they made their money from water. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? It was sort of... Uh, well, for the people who don't know, uh, I know a lot of people do, but especially for the Welsh Welsh people, you know, this is the Teddy Turbo. This is, if you've had the, this was One Nation, yeah, Garage yeah, Nation, yeah. Rave Nation, Dreamscape. Yeah. Dreamscape. This is the man behind, yeah, be, behind the whole thing, like, you know, and mate, what, what was that like to, 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 to do I mean, that? I mean, I again, you know, I think my life has been, yeah, some people say that when they go through life, they have a, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's like there's a path. Mm. Um, and some people believe that you choose your path, but I believe that I'm on my path and it's already been chosen because when I left school, I went into sales. I achieved massive results working in the department store. Then I got headhunted and did like a sales rep job. And then the recession come, we lost the house, lost the job, it was on the dole, had nothing. And it was just like, wow, you know, I'm rock bottom again. I was literally coming out of the hood, if you like, <laughs> going like that. And then I've ended up back where I started. Yeah. I was thinking, this really is shit. And and at the time I was boxing, I was running. Um, you know, my idea of a night out was going to a Shannon and Tracy nightclub is what they used to call it. And it was literally guys in trousers, shoes, shirts, yeah. women in little skirts, white stilettos, and, and you know, revealing tops. And everyone was in there drinking, getting pissed. And then 11 o'clock or maybe midnight, the DJ would put on the erection section, which obviously now we're probably getting cancelled, right? But it was literally like all the love songs would come on and then you'd oh, go, bangers, I can you'd go up to a girl and say, hey, you know, come have a dance. No, fuck off. Okay. And you sort of shuffle away and then somebody would say, yeah. And you'd be like, yeah, great, you know. And they'd be standing there like walking around slowly. And then, um, you know, two, so things would two things would happen. You might get a snog. Or they might say, oh, you know, is my number or, you know, what you're mm. doing after. So it was either you 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 dance with somebody on the erection section. You get you a number. You snog out of your void. Uh, yeah. You, <laughs> if you don't get that, you end up going outside and having a fight or, or having a kebab. So that seemed to be, or if you're really drunk, you might be sick all over yourself. So that was basically clubbing in, in the sort of 80s, really. Brilliant. And, um, you know, I remember the rave scene took off and obviously a lot of people read stuff in papers and also online and they go, oh, well, it's in the paper, it's online, it must be true. And at the time there was a big thing about these illegal raves, people taking drugs, people dying. Excellent. And I was just like, fucking hell, you know, I'm not going to one of them, you know, doing all that stuff. And then all my mates kept on and on and on, come to a rave, come to a rave, come to a rave. And I'm not going to a rave, it's fucking taking drugs, it's not my thing. And it was like, no, no, you've got to come, you've got to come. And after six months of being nagged by these people, I went to a rave and it's like, being transformed into a parallel universe because you walk into this thing and you're normally used to sticky carpets, the erection section, <laughs> and everyone's dressed up and everyone's getting pissed. No one's pissed. Everyone's happy. There's no fights. There's loads of girls in there and they're all coming over going, oh, what are you doing? You know, should we come and have a dance? I was like, wow, you know, they're chatting me up. This is great, right? But obviously I didn't realise that because they was all out their heads. Right? All loved so, up on the X. So I had, a, I had a great time and uh, I remember leaving this club and I was thinking, wow, you know, I'd love to come out to one of these again, but it was really expensive to get in. It was like 20 quid. And, mm. and at the time, that was like half my dull money, right? So I was thinking, how do I, you know, get, how can I go out to another one of these? With, I could only go out once a month, basically. So when I was walking out, there were some people giving flies out. And I said, do you get paid for this, mate? And he went, yeah. I said, do you get in the clubs for free? And he went, yeah. I said, oh, you ain't got any jobs, have you? And he went, yeah. So I got his number, rung him up. Um, and then I had a load of mates that went raving. And I just put two and two together and went to all my mates, look, if I get you in all these clubs for free, why don't, you know, you come out at the end and give out some flyers for me, but I'm getting paid for it, but I'm getting you in for free, VIP. So they're all going, well, it saves us 20 quid, we do it. So straight away, I've now got, I can go out two or three nights a week for free and I'm getting paid for it. So that grew. And then when people knew, oh, if you give out the flyers for Terry, you can get it for free. And everyone's like ringing me up, going, oh, you, you ain't got any, you know. <laughs> Because everyone's thinking yeah, 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 we're yeah. in a recession, right? So people didn't have loads of money. So for them, if they can get in somewhere for free, they do it. So we had this weird sort of thing where it grew and then I was earning some quite good money. And I looked at the flyers and I was looking at the back of a flyer and on the back, there was no one in Surrey where I lived who was selling tickets. And I thought, this is weird. You know, and so I rang, started ringing up the rape and saying, you should have me as a tout for Surrey because you haven't got anyone selling tickets. And there was this big rave for 20,000 people. So I was doing anywhere between 100 and 500, sometimes 1,000 tickets a week. And obviously you'd be getting like 10, 15% on 
the ticket. So yeah, you yeah. can make yourself another few hundred quid a week. So I've gone from earning, you know, 40 quid a week on the dole to now I'm earning, you know, five, 600 quid a week. So even if I'd have had a proper job, I would never have earned, got that. I would never have earned that, that sort of money. And enjoyed your time as well. Exactly. So, so, so I started doing that. Then I thought there's not a magazine for the rave scene. Bear in mind, I, I got the worst grade in English. So I was hardly qualified to become an editor of a magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started that. That grew really quickly. Um, it ended up being 128 page full color magazine in Smiths. And then someone said to me, I think it was nine. And what would it be? Just like pictures of the raves and stuff no, or it DJs? Be, it, would be, it was, it was like Viz, but for okay. raves. So my mum was the agony aunt. She was called Auntie Trisha and she had like Shut a bag up. in her mouth and this like little thing on she like that. And then the ravers would write to her with their, their problems, you know. Um, and then uh, we had, you know, different people doing different columns, but it was about the rave scene. And it was reviews of raves, but it was more about having a laugh with the ravers, like taking the piss out of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was a guy called Lof, Lof, Lof Groover. And we, we, we said, oh, we're going to interview Lost Hoover. And then we got a <laughs> Hoover with some dreads and some sunglasses. That, <laughs> and we interviewed the Hoover, right? And everyone was going, that's the funniest film. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It was just stupid shit that we just come up and go, that'd be quite funny. <laughs> and um, and everyone loved it. And, um, and then somebody said to me, you know, you're doing all these things. You're flying and promoting events, you're selling tickets, you've got your magazine, why don't you put an event on? So I went, yeah, you know, why not? And I, I always used to think raving was about every being, everybody being together as one because you, you're all there as one. There's no trouble. Mm. It's one love, one vibe, one nation. Do you know what I mean? It was all about everybody being together. And, you know, the Conservative Party stole that. I don't know if you've noticed they started yeah. going about one nation, but I, I come up with that name well before the Conservative Party. So I, I, it's a shame I didn't, I registered that trade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some money. yeah. <laughs> but, um, um, but uh but yeah, so so did that. And then four years later did Gary's Nation. Then unfortunately my friend So the music evolved as well then, yeah. So the One Nation would have been well like house or well, drum no, and bass. One or... Nation started off as uh Garage as well. drum and bass, then it went into jungle, then it went back into drum and bass. UK Garage was we always had a UK Garage room, but because that blew up, it blew up massively. We said let's do a garage night, and then yeah. we become the biggest garage promoters. Um, my friend used to run Dreamscape. Yeah. Um, he died in a car crash and his wife just said to me, like, I can't do this anymore. You know, could, do you want to take it? So I was like, yeah, sweet. So I ended up taking the... Um, and were they were, were they nice money earners, these, these events? Yeah. I mean, you know, look, I mean, if you're on £2.65 an hour in McDonald's, yeah. which is what I was on when I was working there, it's and then you're earning thousands of pounds doing events and giving out flyers and selling tickets and stuff, did that and... Uh, you know, look, I had a great time. You know, I was in my twenties putting on these raves all around the world. And I've seen a video time. of you, and you're young, and you're behind the deck. Did you play on the decks at all, or no, that, that was had me. no instruments playing at all? You listen. Just... I try. I tried to learn to DJ, but I could never do it. I just could not pick it up. I tried it. I bought the decks. I bought the records. I had DJ mates that would try and teach me, but I just didn't have that. Unfortunately, I'd probably be all right now because you can you can cheat with the uh, <laughs> uh, USBs, and you can like press the button and put the RPM in and sync it up. Yeah. So it kind of does it for you. I know you still have to know how to do it. Yeah, of course. But of it's course. a lot easier now easier. to be a DJ than it was. Then it was literally like you had to get, there wasn't a machine you could set the no. RPM and the, you know, it was literally like you had to hear it. Do you know what I mean? And uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's kind of deaf. I can't see either. So that, that might have been the other Brilliant. reason. But, but, you know, I had a good time. Um, I was wild in my 20s and um, I didn't give a fuck. So I think. Was you a bit of a mad, mad character in your 20s? Then? Well, I, I just think, you know, and I think that's probably what made me successful in, in that because it was a crazy world. There was yeah, a lot of yeah. aggravation. There was a lot of, uh, you know, violence. There was a lot of people like, you know, uh, gangs and stuff. There'd be all sorts of stuff going on. Cause, and, and back then, there was no nice places to put raves on. So yeah. you'd be in Brixton and it wouldn't be like it is today. Yeah, would you get shootings and that in there? There's always shootings I mean, in there. People getting stabbed. I mean, it was... Like whatever you think and you read about in the papers now where you go, fucking hell, what's happened to the UK? It was like that in the 90s. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it just was, there was no social media. It's recorded more now, yeah. And, you know, if, if someone does a drive-by shooting now, it might be in the paper. But back then it, it wasn't, you know. And uh, we went from doing the events with a couple of securities then having to employ special forces, ex-special forces guys. <laughs> We're dog handlers. We're like, we're bulletproof vests. And it, it can, become... I, can, can I, sorry, can I just interject? This is what I'm, like, it's fascinating to me, but what you're explaining here, like there's a lot of like similarities in like the foot soldier yeah. 
films with the nightclubs and the getting the doorman in and I mean, I mean the, foot, the, foot, the foot soldier film, right? I mean, you know, the, the original one um, was based on a book, right? And there's some things in the book that were just made up and there was things in the film that were made up. Mm. Um, but the, the, the with, with these, with these things, like the stuff that I experienced firsthand, I mean, I was shocked. I even got to the point where I actually phoned up the place and said, look, I'm doing this event in Hackney or Stratford or Tottenham. And back then it was, was it, like if you walked around there at nine o'clock at night, you would get turned over. It wasn't a joke. You know what I mean? So, so I've obviously got 3000 people all turning up in Tottenham. And obviously you've got all the local gangs and you had to deal mm. with all that. And, and I actually rang the police and said, look, how much is it to just pay for an armed response unit just to sit outside the front? Yeah. Because I thought if you see that, everyone's just going to behave themselves. Right? But well, like, the, we the don't do that, sir. And I was like, well, what happens if someone pulls a gun out? Just call 999. I said, yeah. but I might be dead by They're then. response, innit? They're not. They're um, not. And, 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 you know, I kind of got the police's perspective because obviously if they'd have done that for me, they'd have probably had to do it for every club. Um, but I was all about prevention. So the reason we uh, ended up having, you know, quite a big team of guys, dog handlers and all that, is because we, we had to become our own sort of police force, really. And, you know, the club had their doorman and their security. You know, they did the club. They they searched everybody. They made sure that there was no drugs in there. That was their problem because it was their club. But I had my people there because I just thought, if the shit hits the fan here, these guys that are on 10, 15 pounds an hour that, yeah. Working for the club, they're just going to run away. They're not, of course, they're yeah. not going to get involved. But obviously, the people, well. the people I employed were all either martial arts experts, special forces. They they were all all game. You know what I mean? So if anybody wanted to have it, they would. You know, no, nobody really did. They we did get tested a few times, but then I think when they saw what the response was, mm. um, they they didn't come. Again. Was it a time where you was like probably in danger yourself? Like, if yeah, I mean, I, in, in, the reason I sold. Uh, the business was because it got so bad in the late 2002s that you were getting to the point where club owners were just going, we want to get out of this now. We don't want to do this anymore. Um, so we're turning our big nightclubs for 3,000 people or venues. Um, we're converting them into flats and just walk away Property. because they didn't want the aggro. And, and then you got to the point where the ones that were left, you ring them up and go, I want to book a night. And they go, what's the music? And you tell them it's the music. They go, no thanks. Yeah. Or who's playing? And you go, well, <laughs> these are the people I want to book. No, mate. They're well, not. Don't we don't want them here because we've been told that if you book this DJ or this act or this MC, we're going to get aggro. Because what happened then? You had the gang. So now it's all the, like the postcode stuff. So if you've got a gang in SE15 mm. and there's a gang in SE5, they're going to kill each other, right? Same Sidewinders with, yeah. were bad so, for that. So you have it? all the. If you look at London, forget the rest of the country, but we had Birmingham, we had Manchester, we had, you know, Kent, Essex. So you had this melting pot of all these people turning up. And if someone there had a beef with them, it's mm. going to go off. Mm. And, and it got to the point where I actually didn't enjoy it anymore. And I just thought, I can't promote events because I can't book who I want to book. I haven't got the venues I want to put the events on because they're all being sold or being redeveloped. And I just thought my life's at risk. And I just said, you know, what... You know, I've done this for 10 years. I've had a good time. I'm right at the top. If I'm going to sell, now's the time to sell. And I'm glad I did sell it because I think after a year, I regretted selling it. But then when I actually spoke to the people that bought both One Nation and Gary's Nation, was a nightmare. they said from when they bought it till 2010, which is seven years, mm -hmm. they made a bit of money. They lost a bit of money. The, the, you know, they didn't really, they just, they put more money in than they took out. Well, Garage Dot, you know, it's, it's been a, a sound that's kind of dipped a lot, hasn't it? I think it's come back recently. I, you yeah. know, I started to hear a bit of Garage and more now, like, but... No, I think, look... You probably got the, up on the right the, time. The, I think with the drum and bass scene now, oh, it's the DJs have become the, the gods. So Andy C will go to Wembley and he'll get 10,000 people going to watch him. He wouldn't have been able to do that in their time because he wouldn't have been big enough. Mm. Um, we had to have 10 DJs to do that. Um, but it's like with the UK Garage thing now... You know, you go to a garage night now and they're playing all the same songs that we were playing yeah. when we were doing it. So it's just, it's become like a back to the old school. Yeah, it's know, retro days, isn't it? Like, yeah, so, uh, yeah. so the whole scene has become retro. And I, I, we did a documentary. We've done two, actually. One was 
called United Nation, three decades of drum and bass, which is about the One Nation story, about the DJs, about the whole, whole stuff. Yeah, I've seen. And then we did one called 25 Years UK Garage, which was me and my partner, Jason, me and my partner, Jason Kay. Um, you know, that was about how we created Garage Nation, what we did. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, a couple of weeks ago, he, he dropped down dead. So oh, um, yeah, yeah. that was the last, um, you know, thing we did together. We was at the premiere together in December. And um, we were actually joking about we should come back and do something. But the problem, like, and we had every D, every garage act, DJs, Majestic. You got any so, so whoever you can think of was there. And they all, and I was saying to him, you know, it's such a shame that the scene, yeah, it needs to be reignited. And I said, the problem is when we were doing it, you were doing like 20 events a month. So you had all these different club nights. Then you had Sidewinder. Then you had all these other events and literally oh, scout, uh, if you had a music if you had some music that you wanted to break if you give ez so solid crew you know um jason k whoever this is my record they could go and play in 20 events over a weekend and then those people will go what's that tune and they go out to the record shop yeah, there's no record shops now right because mm. vinyl's gone right i know they keep saying it's coming back but yeah, a lot of people who go to the record shop is community they buy their records, they buy their tape packs, they buy some merchandise, they buy their tickets for their events. So you're this community. So obviously when the record shop shut down, when the club shut down, when everything becomes festivalised, where everything's just into, into festivals, you know, that's what's caused it to go the way it's gone. Um, the only thing good that's really evolved out of um, UK Garage was it went into grime, then it went into drill. And a lot of people, you know, say it's a bad thing and blah, blah, blah. But you know, it's Look, made Skepta, of, yeah, Skepta, uh, why you D. Dizzy. All these people have been inspired by Kano from that time. So you know, it's and we 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 started. That. started so that. it's good. It's good for us to sort of sit back now and go. Pioneers. That's gone from what we created. We started that off, and then the crews come in, and then it's just gone like that. And mm -hmm. it's it's. I mean, you know, sometimes I look back on that and go, "How did I?" And at the time, because I was in it. You, you don't realize. take you take it for granted. You, it's like you're going to work. That's your job. You know, you put raves on. You know, there's three thousand people. You know, that's what I do. There was no, um, I didn't. I don't think I ever realized how great it was what I was doing. And and I always joked with people. I wish I could go to one of my own raves. You know, but no, um, know. yeah, but it's mad. And then when I sold it, you know, within about six months, I just got a random phone call. I'm making a film. Do you want to be in it? And I was like, yeah, why not? Just want to quickly stop you there and just say, guys, uh, you know, if you enjoy content like this, then please subscribe, hit that like button, leave a comment. Everything we do here is self-funded and it would be a massive help. If you enjoy content like Teddy Stone, then please hit that subscribe button and stay central. What do you know about Wales' number one rated security provider, Boss Security? Boss Security Limited are a professional security service provider based in South Wales, but servicing clients on a national scale. With over 10 years of experience in the security industry, they are true experts in all aspects of security. From CCTV monitoring, man guards, mobile patrols, and alarm response, they provide the most advanced technology on the market, along with an expert team of staff delivering complete security solution to their clients throughout the UK. And I was a bit lost because I... Obviously, when you're running at such a, you know, the flyers, the magazine, the tickets, the Flat events, you've got right. all this stuff going on, and all of a sudden it's just nothing, right? So you wait in the morning, the phone's not ringing, you haven't got to be anywhere, you haven't got anyone driving you mad, you haven't got to organise anything, and you've sort of had six months of bumming around. And um, my, my, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, said, you know, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. I said, I'm something had come up, and she said, oh, you should maybe do property, set up a business. And then because this person phoned me up and put me in this film, that got me the bug for it. And then after that, yeah. it was like, oh, well, how do I be an actor? Well, you've already done a part. Get the footage, get some pictures, write to the agents. And I've got an agent and he got me a bit in EastEnders. So I'm thinking, wow, you know, I'm going to Hollywood. Right? Yeah. And then, and then, and then there's a book called The Luck Factor, right? The what? Yeah, the Luck Factor, which everyone should read. And it says, when you try and do something you've never done before, you normally get a little bit of luck. And that, getting that EastEnders thing was a bit of luck, right? But then after that bit of luck, it's like, oh, 
I don't actually know what I'm doing. I actually do need to learn this. So then you had to do the drama training and then you start, you know, going for auditions. You don't get your auditions and you think, fucking hell, this is really, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the problem is, and I didn't know this at the time, but 95% of all actors are unemployed. So if I'd have known that, I'd have probably not done it. I'd have said, fuck this, you know, it's not this stupid. Risky. Right. Mm. But I went into it because I, I, I wanted to do it. I wanted to prove more. I thought I'm going to be in that top 5%. And after a year, I think I don't like eight grand. And I remember like thinking, you know, this, I've made a massive fucking mistake here. I've gone into this stupid profession where fucking nobody's working mm. and I'm going to earn eight grand. And, and even though I had money from selling my events business, it's not going to last forever. How much, you, how much did you make off selling the garage promotions? And none of your fucking business. <laughs> <laughs> um, NFB. But no, um, all joking. <laughs> <laughs> what? No, N-O-Y. You be. But no, but seriously. Was it big numbers though? But no, listen, look. It was worth doing, right? Yeah. But I was joking when I said that. But no, to be honest... People say, oh, you know, it was millions. Right? It wasn't millions. But the thing is, um, you know, for me, it was like private business. You know what I mean? It's sort of like, you know, I did have a bid in war because I everyone wanted to buy the brands because they were great mm. um, and they were the top ones. So everybody was going, I'll give you this for it. I'll give you that for it. And I ended up taking taking the most. And it was funny because one of the guys that rang me up and said, said, I might make you this offer. Don't fucking ring me up and say, oh, you know, I'm getting more from there. I said, that's my final offer. And I said, all right, fine. So I got a high offer and took it. He ran me up and he goes, why don't you come back to me? I said, well, you told me that was your final offer. Really? Do you know what I mean? But the thing is, um, what that did was give me a buffer. So when I was acting, to create. I, I could say, well, I'm going to go and learn how to act for two years. You know, I'm going to invest in my career, yeah, right? Yeah. And after about a year and having the bad news, you know, you've only earned eight grand, I just thought this money is going to run out at some point. So I need to do something else. And I remember being with a friend of mine who, who I was very close to, who'd who done well in business, but he wasn't a promoter, he was just a mate. Um, and we're chatting away and he said, um, how's the acting going? And I said, fucking terrible. I said, I've only earned eight grand this year. I said, I've got a mortgage, a wife, I've got a kid. I said, you know, this is not great. I said, I've really fucked up. I might see if they want to sell me the brand back. And he went, Terry, he said, you've already gone on this journey now. So you've got to start, stick at it. What do you want to do? And I said, I want to do movies. He said, well, why don't you make one? You put all these events together. It can't be that difficult. So I said to him, look, if I get a script and I can put it together, would you put some money in? And he went, yeah, I'll put some money. I said, well, I'll put some money in. How much are you going to put in? He said, I'll put in 10 grand. I said, well, I'll put in 10 grand. So I left that meeting thinking, well, I've got 20 grand now to make a movie. Obviously, you couldn't make a movie for 20 grand. So then I rang all my mates up and said, look, I know it sounds mad, but I'm going to make a movie. We might lose all their money, but let's just do it because it'd be a laugh and, you know, we can say we made a movie. So all my mates were like, yeah, why not? It'd be funny, right? So we've, we've kind of made this movie for 140 grand and it was called One Man and His Dog. And it was a dog film, right? Because we didn't know what he was doing. We got a script. We thought it'd be funny. We got a director. We employed people basically to do it for us. But that really was like my film school. That was like going to film school for three years, but condensing it down into a year. So... That taught me how not to make a film. And then, but what it did, it opened doors. Because then people started seeing, oh, mm. you made a film. So then people started coming out of Woodwork saying, Terry, I've got an idea for a film. I've got a book. I've got this. I've got that. And um, I remember coming out of Ascot. And I made, uh, we made probably the first proper urban gangster film, which was like a British Boys in the Hood called Rolling with the Nines. And yeah. That had Kano, uh, Estelle, it had um, Dizzy Rascal. That was a legendary yeah. film. I was, it had yeah. all, the, all the people from that scene, because they were my mates. Channel U days, I was. And, yeah. and, and then we had some really good actors like Jason Fleming, Robbie G was in Snatch, Fast Blackwood from Lockstock. So we had all this amazing, you know, and it got back to nominate one, one Rain Dance. And that really did put me on the map. I remember the tune for them as well, yeah. We had a big, we had a big premiere in Leicester Square. Um, so, so that really was like, wow, Terry's fucking doing movies now, right? And it's not just some crappy, the one man his dog thing, I think people was like, well, that's his first one. Give him but a chance. We still got 25% of our money back. Oh, so, brilliant. So it was like, we didn't know what he was doing, but we still got something back. We didn't lose it all. But um, we did roll him with the nines and then that was, but everyone sort of knew about that film. And um, 
But that was a good calling card because the guys that wrote and directed that, um, we were trying to do some other films together. And I come out of um, Ascot Racecourse because I went to the races and there used to be an Italian restaurant um, in the high street that whenever we went to the races in Ascot, we always used to go to this yeah. Italian called Chow Night. It's not there now, but we always used to go there and they did a great pasta and wine. So we used to always go there, me and my wife, and have, you know, pasta and some wine. And Carlton Leach was on the door and he was like, oh, um, you're in a movie business now, aren't you? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, uh, he goes, well, I've got a book. You should make it into a movie. And I was just like, and he gave me the book and it was called Muscle and it had a picture of him on the front going like that. And I just thought, who's going to want to watch a film about a doorman? That was my initial thought. Yeah. And then I sort of went home and read the book. And in the book, right, obviously it was saying that he was the main guy from the ICF and he knew um, the Essex boys and he bodyguarded Nigel Benn and all this stuff. So I was just thinking, something in this book, you know, obviously they say don't judge a book by its cover, right? So I thought, you know, this could be interesting, right? Because you've got the sort of football stuff and then you've got the gangster stuff. So my initial pitch, if you said to me, what's that book? I'd have said it's Football Factory and it's Goodfellas, yeah. right? So I remember ringing up Julian and William Gilby, who I was working with, who did Rolling with the Nines. I said, I've read this really good book. Football Factory has been a big success. I reckon we should do this, right? So they read it and they went, you know, yeah, we, we, we do your script. But that's how much it is. So I, I rang up Colton and I said, I've read your book and I like it. I said, why don't we, you know, do something, right? So agree, agreed to, you know, do a deal with him, pay him some money for his rights and whatever. And then I then paid the guys to write the script. I then went around for two years trying to get that film off, which was Rise of the Foot Soldier, right? So I was knocking on all the doors, trying to get investors, trying to get finance. And then I stumbled upon some guys who were like West Ham fans who had a film production company. And they said, we will put up the money for this film. And, you know, but we want the rights. And I was just like, I was like, the fucking film. Do you know what I mean? Because I've gone from making these tiny films for 140 grand, 250 grand to this. This looked like another step in 1. the 1.3 million pound film. And um, that was, you know, our Rise of the Foot Soldier got made. And now the rest it's a, is now history. It's, now it's a franchise. There's been six of them. Um, and it's crazy, really. How, you know, like, I knew the film, when, I, when we was making the film, it had something special. It had a special feel to it. And when I watched the film, you know, it, it, it did send shivers up my spine. I just thought, we've really, because the problem when you make a film is and, and and it doesn't matter if you're spending 300 million or 1 million or 100 grand on a film, right? Some t look at the Blair Witch Project, right? Yeah. That was made for 30 grand. It made 150 million, right? So sometimes you get that little bit of magic yeah. and I don't know yeah. how you get it or why you get it, but it's like the film gods smile at you. Yeah, yeah give you're you the right. fairy dust, you're right. right? And that just happens to be, that was yeah. just that film where, which, you know, we didn't know... Um, I mean, it didn't do any business at the cinema, but obviously no, massive business of on DVD. It went out in America. It went out in Australia, New Zealand, and um, yeah, it went out in Germany. And and it and it was, and and the funny thing is, when we we recently released um, a Rise of the Foot Soldier computer game. Yeah. And what's funny is we was looking to tack it on the back of Rise of the Foot Soldier Origins, but we we couldn't get the game ready in time. So what happened was. Um, the distributor come out and said, look, you know, this is like a cult film. You've done an extended version. Why don't you remaster it and do all the sound and all the, all the music and make, bring it up to date. So it's still the same film, but it's just basically remixed, remastered 20 minutes longer. So we said, actually, why don't we do that? So we did a premiere to celebrate 16 year anniversary of the first film. But this, when you, when you say version, 20 minutes longer, the bits yeah, you so there was seen, there was scenes that weren't in the original. Yes, okay. So we okay. basically re-edited the original and put these in. Brilliant. Um, but then obviously you grade it so it looks a bit more modern and, you know, it's remastered. So obviously back then, I don't know what it was, but obviously the Dolby and the surround sound and stuff yeah. now is better than it was in 2007. I think so, that gritty look though is, is what, is what makes it still It still special. looks the same, but it, it's just slightly, like if you're a geek, right? You know the You difference. would know, right? But if you're not a geek, you go, it's the same film. But it's a bit longer. Yeah. But then it's spotting what's been put in. And I I haven't seen that film for probably 10 years. And I've literally sat in Leicester Square watching that film. 
Um, and obviously we was like, this is the first film. We're celebrating this and the game's out. You can play Tony Tucker or Pat Tate or Craig Rolf in it. Um, and it was like amazing, really. And I watched the film and I remember walking out thinking, I don't remember it being that good. But the thing is, it is obviously, and it's very difficult if you've been involved in creating a film or producing a film or starring in a film, if you were sitting there going, this is so amazing, people just think, do you know what I mean? It's just like, you know, you just fucking, the ego's taken over. But yeah, I actually watched it again. I always thought it was a good film, but I didn't, that made me think, actually, this is one of the best films, if not the best film I've, I've been involved in. You know, so I was very happy. It was only that, so it was only recently that you thought that then? Well, no, I've always thought it was good. But the thing is, I've done I've done so many films and, and they're all so different. You know, and obviously The Rise of the Foot Soldier Origins, where I played the, the my first lead role with Vinnie Jones, that's probably my favourite film. Because, I enjoyed it. Because that was literally going back to explain everything. So when you watch the first one, it all makes sense. Right? Yeah. So you've kind of, it's all in the wrong order. Do you know what I mean? But that film, I'd say... There's probably, you know, out of the 31 films I've made, there's probably 10, which I would say are outstanding, in my opinion. Right? Well, I, I was just saying then about, uh, before we got on here, about, because you've done two Essex Boys, you've done two films that are based on the Essex, you've done five Foot Soldier, the two different franchises, you could say, yeah. uh, with the Bonded by Blood. And, and, and I, I, it's, it's fascinating because you play the same character, but totally different Imagery, like, you know, yeah. what was the thought process in that? No, so, so what happened, right, is because I don't know why the Essex boys are so popular, like the craze, right? You know, if you actually said to anybody in this country, who are the most famous crim criminals in this country? You'd say the craze and the Essex boys, right? But they probably weren't yeah. the, the worst, right? And they probably weren't the most powerful, but they were the most famous. And um, in 2009, there was a company called Revolver Entertainment, which is an award-winning distribution company, and they were getting into production. And they went, look, we really want to do an Essie's Boys film. You you play Tony Tucker. You develop the rise of the film. Why don't we do it together? And I was like, okay, well, what will you put in? And they said, well, we'll put this much money in. Okay. So Bernardo Mahoney yes. um, had written a book called Bonded by Blood. And I thought, we actually want something that we can base this upon. And at the time... Look, Bernard Mahoney, I've met him probably four times in my life. He's always been all right with me. Um, people say he's, he's a grass and he's this and he's that. I don't know, right? All I know is he was the kind of Essex boys, the voice of authority on that. Obviously, he's done loads of documentaries, loads of books. And he was on the door with him. So, you yeah. know, he probably knows as much he's as... He's obviously got insight. He knows yeah. as much yeah, as yeah, from anyone else, you know what I mean? Whether, whether he's a grass or not, I don't know. <laughs> but I've always took him face value he's always been all right with me mm. and he said look here's my book here's the rights same same thing with i did with carlton with him you know we, we get your rights we make the film um and you know he was very helpful yeah. read the scripts give us some what pointers. is bernard being accused of a grass for so to do with the case I, don't know. I think i think him and carlton fell out and i think him and other people fell out and i think mm. where he's written books about the underworld, or so about. dry snitching in a way, like where he's he's seeing well, it in a book. Do, do you know? Do you know what? Look, it. you know, he makes money out of writing books, right? And you know, Wensley Clarkson is a great crime author. He's written books about every criminal, mm. right? You could say, you know, by him writing the books, you know. So, look, I don't know. You know, people have said that he is a grass, but I, as I said, mm. I don't know if it's true, and I don't buy into bullshit. You know, what I mean, if I meet you and you you're all right with me. And some yeah. say, oh, he's this and he's that and he's that. I'm just I'm not interested in your bullshit, you know what I mean? Because people always talk shit about people. So for me, I don't need to, you know, I I I, I wanted his book. He gave me his book. He's, he's always been fine with me. He's always promoted the stuff on social media. He's always been like, this is my film, Bonded by Blood. And obviously when we did Rise of the Foot Soldier Origins, um, Andy Loveday, who, who produced the um, Foot Soldier Origins um, with me and Richard and... and uh, Terry Loveday, um, he actually said, you know, we want to bring the Bernard Mahoney character in because he was around Tony. So that's how Vinnie Jones got involved. And obviously Bernie yeah, gave brilliant. Andy, um, you know, he was a consultant on the film, so he fed in a yeah. lot of information. Well, I've seen um, a video of Carlton saying how Vinnie was very lazy, not putting on a Birmingham accent. Do you know, something, do you know something? Look, in, in life, you know, 
I'm sure Carlton would have liked Vinnie Jones to have played him, right? Um, but the, the oh. rea- but the reality is, um, you know, that was Vinnie's choice, you know. And and the thing is, we're not making a documentary, you know. And I think, you know, if Vinny wanted to be the authentic Ben Lamhoney, he could have put on a Brummie accent. But he chose not to, and he's an actor, and that's his choice, you know. Um, and, and again, you know, we were lucky to get Vinny in that film, playing that part, because... Oh, just, it's a snatch. He, he just lost his wife and, you know, he was in a really dark place and, you know, he happened to be in the country. He's normally in LA. So yeah. the fact that we were like, look, we've got this role. Um, and, you know, I thought he was really good in it. Amazing. Yeah. So, so look, if you want to be, you know, critical about it, you could say, well, why didn't he play a Birmingham accent? But then you could say, well, you know, in Rise of Foot, such one, you know, did Carlton really take on the Turkish map? Do you, do you know what I mean? So um, you can sort of go through stuff and you so can these, pick holes in things that you can say, well, that wasn't true. That was false. You're a grass. You're this. You, everybody can find something to yeah, basically yeah, criticise. So. But the thing is, um, as I said, Bernie actually was in the movie as well, which was quite funny. He played a little, one of the doormen at Raquel's on, on, on Origins, right? And he met with Vinny and told Vinny about what he did and how he did it and blah, blah, blah. And Vinny said that was really useful. And, you know, he promoted the film, he came to the premiere. So, again, you know, just like when... I've seen interviews of Bernard Mahoney, yeah. though, and I think Vinny did play him, like, well, yeah, regardless of the accent or not. There was an got, image of him. he got the character. Like but, again, you know, um, when I look at this stuff, um, I just sort of think, you know, as I said, the only dealings I've had with Bernard Mahoney was I bought the book, The Bonded by Blood, from him. He come on set, he he advised us, right, on, on the stories and what, these different things. Just like he did on, you know, I've probably, you know, met him four or five times yeah, actually yeah. in person, right? But he's always been really, you know, nice to me on the internet, and he's always been very like promoting stuff, you know. And oh, well, to be honest, uh, you're a businessman at the end of the day. You're not on the streets, you know. This grass code and I like it's not like oh, oh you you know, hang around gen- with the grass. Gen- genuinely, uh, for me, I make fucking movies. Right? <laughs> I, I pretend <laughs> to play villains. Yeah, I, I don't need to. Uh, yeah, uh, you know. You know, it's grass and cold, man. It's like, yeah, you know, I'm, if, I'm if, never... I was, if I was a villain, right, then maybe I would say, well, was your grass? And then if someone said, oh, yeah, he's done this, that, and the other, then maybe yeah, I wouldn't talk yeah. to him. But I'm not in that world. So it exactly. It doesn't interest me. And, and I, 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 I did will want to just quickly, probably, you probably don't want to talk about it, but I, I'll ask about the carton thing quickly. But before I do that, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> the Bonded by Blood character and the Rise of the Foot Soldier character. Right, okay. then, I'll yeah. tell you what yeah. happened, right? So we, 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 we sort of went off on a tangent, right? So, so but basically, um, when we spoke to Revolver, they was like, you know, we don't want Tony Tucker to wear a silly wig, right? I was like, okay. Um, but that was what his hair was like. No, we, we want to do a different character. I said, okay, why don't you get Jeff Bell to play Tony Tucker? I won't even be in it. I'll just produce it. Jeff Bell. Right? And <laughs> so Jeff Bell was going to be Tony Tucker, to, uh, obviously, Craig Fairbass wouldn't play Pat Tate because he's already played Pat Tate. Um, and this was he, obviously... What, he, he, was he a potential for it? Well, no, no, because he wouldn't have done it. You know, could bear in mind, um, there was no plan for Foot Soldier 2, right? There was no, okay. plan, there was no plan for that. So if I'd have gone back to Craig, do you want to play... Pat so there Tate? was Foot Soldier 1 and then Bonded by Blood? Yeah. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Sorry, go on. Um, and, um, and, then, and then, yeah, they said, no, we don't want you, but we want you. I've already played it, you know, but I just thought, you know, but they said, no, we really need you because you, you're going to be the one that people are going to want to watch because it's you without the silly wig. So I said, all right, we'll do it. So we ended up doing it. And um, you, I, I feel like you was more vicious on that one in the sense, right. like the Tony Tucker on his foot soldier is, you're a serious motherfucker you don't want to fuck with, but right. you're quite like loud. You was, you know, you loved your drugs on the other one, but I felt like you, you you seem very more vicious on yeah. on, on on bonded by but that blood. was that was again that was a choice. Do you know what I mean? Because I, I didn't just want to be the same character. Of course, I wanted to play a different Tony Tucker so that people watch both films and went, "Oh, he doesn't just do that; he can actually do that." Yeah. You know. So for me, it was uh, and it was good. I've not worked with Tam Sam before. Um, you know, uh, your favorite Pat eight? Yeah. Um, do I have a favorite? Was it Tammy or no, Craig's brilliant? Today? I mean, the thing is, like, I thought Tamma was great. Um, and I thought Pat was uh, Pat. I thought Craig was great. Yeah. Um, but but you know I like them both. And and the thing is, you know I think if you if you was to say who's the best Tate, I think the fact that there's been there's been it's going to be there's been again, multiple yeah. films with Craig in, um, and there's only been one film with Tammy. And I think you would say, well, 
you know, but then there wasn't an opportunity when they did Bond Blood Blood 2, there was no role because they were dead, yeah. right? So they weren't going, oh, well, let's go back and do a spin off like I did on, in Foot Soldiers. So it was like the next generation instead, yeah. weren't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, so obviously I, I, I've seen a video uh, that Carlton put up on YouTube. So you obviously f fallen out with him because I'll be fair, what he said was um, about like the numbers of like, you know, milking it type of thing. And I've got a Facebook post here. Right? You're probably going to laugh at this, right. but this is a Facebook post someone put up, right? right? When this is when the origins come out okay. and he goes, um, Rise of the Foot Soldier 5. Oh my gosh, it's like getting blood out of Teddy Stone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you know something? Do you know, what 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 is uh, what is sad, right? Is obviously you know, I, I, if if I hadn't have bought that book, right, and I hadn't have done all that hard work getting that film off, yeah, right, he wouldn't have done a fucking tour. Nobody would really know who he is, right? He would have just been, oh yeah, he was a doorman and he was in the ICF, ICF. and he knew these guys, but he would never have become as as famous as he is now. Mm -hmm. And you know he did a tour after the after the thing, and I think the sad thing about it is he's never once thanked me, right? And all he ever seems to do is just go online and just go on about what about the families. But when he did the first one, he didn't even it was it was he didn't care about the families. But now because he's not involved, it seems to be about the families, and you know he he just sort of spout keeps spouting all this shit online. And you just sort of think, you know, what is wrong with this guy? Do you know what I mean? It sort of doesn't make any sense because I've never said or done anything to him. I've got no, you know, I haven't fallen out of him. I haven't even seen him. But I think what he's done is, um, you know, he's obviously, um, he fell out with with Carnaby, um, Andrew Loveday, who, who, was, who did um, the, the Rise of the Foot Soldier because he decided to do another film called Rain of the General. With, with, yeah, but bear in mind, he's already sold the rights. Yeah, that's... Yeah. right. So it's like, I sell the rights to my book and my life to you, and then you decide, well, actually, I'm going to go off and make another film, even though I've sold the rights. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll and, put it into perspective. I, 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 me and my dad, we used to do the claims, you know, personal injuries, and, like, someone, one guy come to us right. to do a claim. He was getting paid out and everything. And then he took his claim to another claim firm right. to try and get paid out with them. Right. And you're like, well, no, you're with us. Yeah. And he was like, it's like, it don't make fucking sense. You can't do that, can you? Well, what he did was he he, he went off and made this film and uh, ended up having all the same actors playing all the same roles in the first one. So not only did he not have the rights to do that, but he, and obviously, you know, this is nothing to do with me, Right. Because at that point, I, I'd sold the rights to Carnaby. So what happened is I'd, I wanted to make the film, so I went, there's the rights. So they've then acquired the rights, and they've then funded the film, which has benefited me. It's benefited Cohen. Cohen's released a book. Cohen's done a tour. Mm. He's got all this amazing stuff off the back of what I've done, right? But And this is the thanks that I get, you know. And, and the problem is a lot of the fans – don't know any of this. And there's a lot of people that think Colton, you know, they follow what he says and goes, oh yeah, you know, what about families? Right? But uh, as I said, there was no mention of families in the first one. And if there had have been, if he'd have said, oh, you know, look, you know, we're doing this, we should do something for the families, then we would have done something for the families. But that was never a conversation. And it's kind of like you agree to do a deal with somebody, you sign up to do a deal with somebody. And then three or four years later, you go, yeah, we've done that deal. I don't actually like that deal now. Can we, actually just do this other deal because this actually suits me better. And, you know, when we spoke to Carl, we said to him, what do you want? You know, he could have said, I want to be in all the films. I, every time a film's made, I want to get a payout. But he didn't, right? So you can't agree to deal with somebody and then later on decide, oh, actually, I shouldn't have signed that deal. Maybe I should sign it. Actually, can we just reach it? So you can't rewrite history, right? And then I think what happened was, when he made that film, it got taken off him, right? So the Carnaby is a PLC and they basically went, right, you've basically took made this film without the rights or the permission. We own the rights. So they then took the film, re-edited it and released it as Rise of the Foot Soldier 2. So I think, <laughs> obviously, for him, it was a massive, like, it, it, it was humiliating. Well, it's, right? it's a learning curve. It's, it's humiliating for him because he's obviously – gone yeah you can do this i've got the rights blah blah and they've took took what he said at face value so and then and then because 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 you know 
he's then had it taken off of him. Obviously, there was bad blood between Carnaby and between between Carlton. So, mm, unfortunately, go. because I was the guy who went to Carnaby to get the yeah. film made, for some reason, you know, he he, he has, feels like he has to keep going about me with the silly wig, you know, playing his best mate and all this. But the thing is, you know, I've I've honestly like every time I sit, you know, I, I don't look at any of this stuff anymore because I just look at it and I just think. What's wrong with you, mate? Do you know what I mean? It's sort of like, yeah. it, you know, it's all uncalled for, right? And, and you know, if I've got something to say to somebody, I will say it to face. I wouldn't start posting silly videos up on social media and carry on every time the film comes out. Oh, it's another load of bollocks. It's this, it's that. You know, if I was him, I would have actually supported it because I'd be thinking, actually, every time they make one of these films, it means that they're going to watch Rise of the Foot. So people discover... Rise of the Foot, the new Rise of the Foot Soldier. People that haven't seen any of them, and they go, "Oh, there's four or five of these." The they didn't go and buy all the other films, and then they go, "Fucking hell, can't believe it. who's that?" Oh, he's the guy. Oh, he's got a documentary. I buy that. Oh, he's got a book. I buy that. Oh, there's a signed picture. I buy that. So for me, it's like, you know, the opportunity yourself in the, the foot. opportunities that he could have had out of it. He shouldn't be hating on the, these films that are being made. He should be embracing it and going. Listen, I'm not involved, but, you know, glad to see that they're, st- you know, look, there's, for all the people that love Rise of the Foot Soldier, there's a lot of people that hate it. And there's they say, you know, it's just mindless violence. It's this, it's that. Th- this isn't the, the, how the guys are. But the problem is so many people watch it that, Demand. that it's like, you know, if nobody watched it, they wouldn't make any more. But, you know, every time they make another one, they ring me and say, oh, we want you back as Tony Tucker. Sell, yeah. And I'm a jobbing actor, right? So I'm not going to turn around and say, no, I've played that part two times, you know. If, if I'm busy, it might be a different thing. But if I'm not busy and someone rings me up and says, do you want to come to my bar for a month and be in this film and we're going to pay you X? <laughs> I'm not going to go, uh, I'm not actually doing anything, but because I've already played that part, I don't want to do it. So of course I'm going to play that part. Yeah. And the thing is, unfortunately for me as an actor, everybody says so that's the best role that I play. So for me, it's sort of like, you know, if you're Ian Bill and EastEnders, right, and everybody loves Ian Bill and EastEnders, he could have come out of EastEnders after a year, but he stayed in it for however long because people like him. It's like yeah. Alfie Moon, right? It's like, you know, do, do people say, why does Vin Diesel always do the Fast and the Furious? Well, because people like him and because it's a good, and, you know, whatever you say about them foot soldier films, they are entertaining, they are fun. And they tick the boxes. And if you like crime films, you know, it's entertainment. We're not making a true story. We're not mm. deliberately trying to upset people. It's just fun. Do you know what I mean? And it's, yeah. I think people get, um, you know, obviously there's there's jealousy and there's people get. When did it get, stuff. when did you get sour with him then? Was it like straight after no, number it, one? I just, I just kept seeing like when, I think when, I think when the, when the, 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 the film was made, the unofficial film was made and then they had all that stuff going on. I think obviously he had a big fallout with them, but you know he obviously. That's mad that he tried doing a number two though, but, but or, or think, doing another yeah, one after think, seeing the family. But, but I think, but I think he's probably um, he's probably looked at it and thought, you know, that guy, you know, because I was His the mate. one because I was the one who got the first one made. He probably thinks that you know you. I'm involved in it somehow, yeah. but I'm not, right? Yeah. But it, but you know, and look, you know. It, it, if if he, I, I kind of understand why he'd be upset, because if if everywhere you go, people go, oh, why aren't you in the the new foot soldier film? Or oh, there was somebody that goes, oh, can't, was that you? So I, I can imagine that it, it annoys him, right? That he's not involved anymore. But the thing is, if he could have been, and um, you know, it's it's sort of like you know, if 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 you go if you go and upsetting people and saying stuff, and you, you know, pe- people aren't gonna. I mean, I think they did ring him up and say, on that uh, origins, oh, we're doing this film. Why don't you actually play yourself and, you know, come in and go, Carlton, you know what I mean? Because it's for the fans and they'd all enjoy it. I'm not doing it. I won't. I refuse to do it. And it's like, okay. But they, they, the door it, was but, open. But, 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 I, but I wouldn't have done that. But they actually did it. They said, actually, let's, let's offer Carlton an olive branch because we don't want him to keep slating the franchise. Let's, you know, give him some, you know, 
and, and nobody can understand why he doesn't embrace it because if he embraces it, he make money out of it. Mm. I mean, it's, I, I don't get it personally, but you know, it doesn't, it sure. doesn't, you know, it doesn't affect my life whatsoever. So I don't really, you know. Um, obviously, it, it is a film, like you said. You know, the three, four, and five maybe. You know, um, they're not based on true stories, but like. As for the the Damascus boys, do, who do you do? Who do you think those killers are? Do you think it's the ones they've they've? I mean, they've I, I, I know there's been yet yeah, another documentary to you know unveil the truth um, on Sky, and uh, I watched it because I thought you know maybe there's some some new information. But um, you know, in the original, it was the people that were in jail, it was the police, or it was a firm they'd upset. Yeah. So. I, I don't. I don't think the police did it. I think that was just a conspiracy theory, and we put it in the film because, yeah. you know, it was that thing that the no, nobody universes. knows what happens. But yeah. these are the three things that people, everyone seems to be yeah. saying. But I think um, from watching that documentary again, sorry, from watching that documentary that, that's just come out, and all the research we've done, all the conversations we've had, um, I genuinely think um, uh, Mickey Steele was obviously known for flying planes into Essex and, mm. and dropping drugs off in fields, right? Yeah. And they obviously went to a field, right? So even if he didn't do it, he might have said, I'll meet me wherever, knowing that somebody, so somebody could have put him up to it. It could have just been a coincidence. I mean, when you look it at- It could be the, a fit up for him, yeah. When you look at the, um, the, the evidence, when they did the mobile phone stuff and all the rest of it, you know, he was where he said he was but they couldn't pinpoint it into the location. And obviously he didn't have any, um, there was no DNA, there was no uh, gunpowder on him, you know, when they got him. So, you know, look, who knows? Yeah. Right? yeah Some, just... Somebody somebody has definitely done it, but nobody knows. The people who know are dead. And, um, you know, people can say, oh, yeah, my dad did, did it, my... My, yeah, my, my one guy who says he done it, he, his dad done anything. So I, I don't know his name, Nipper. Yeah, Nipper but, but he's written a book called The Last Man Standing. As he was, so he obviously, yeah, wants to get his book turned into a film. So I don't know if he made it up or whether his dad did say that to him on his deathbed. But Would you take that into um, consideration as the Foot Soldier franchise and well, bring that in there? It, it, I don't know if you saw in, have you seen the documentary? Not the, not the recent one you're talking about. No. So My dad you, just said that. It's on Netflix, is yeah, it? No, it's on Sky. Oh, but okay. when you watch it, they actually sit down and they say, oh, did you, um, uh, did you, uh, you know, the, the detectives that were either involved in the murder or the detectives that were trying to see if there's yeah. any new evidence, they spoke to him and they, I think they said to him something like, um, okay, so your dead dad, your dad's dying and he tells you he's done this thing. You know, who did he did it with? And they went into a little bit of detail, but the guy then started getting angry and couldn't answer the questions. Mm. You sort of thought, you know, if you are telling the truth, they've made you look like you're not. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, I, I don't, I don't, and I think that. Did he do the, that knowingly like Even it? the police um, that looked into it, because obviously if someone turns up and says, oh yeah, he's done the crime, they have to look oh, into it. Him, yeah. So I think maybe, maybe there is a, is maybe that, there is, maybe there is, yeah. um, uh, but they dismissed it saying it's not, it wasn't, okay. you know, it wasn't, wasn't, I didn't believe it. So I know. don't know if it's a bit of a myth bust, but I just want to, cause, cause we're Welsh anyway. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't know if it's that nip at Ellis. Cause it seems like it's the guy on the film, but on the foot soldier, you've got Taffy, the guy who fucking meant to have shot Pate. Yeah. Is, is that a real person based um, on it? Or is I, that nip at Ellis? Or, do you know what? I, think I don't know that, where the Taffy I, come from. Like. I, think, I think that might, that might be nip Ellis. Um, I, I, I or it, I think it might, I, I, you know, I can't remember, but um, I know that they made the guy Welsh because they wanted to have that Welsh, the, all the Welsh jokes, you know. Yeah. You Welsh cunt and all that sort well, of stuff. Well, I was going to say, I remember. So, so there was a lot of stuff in there um, um, and, and it was all it was all done tongue in cheek. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it's actually quite funny because when I'm in Wales, I do get put up going, you fucking Welsh bastard. And all that. <laughs> you know, you fucking <laughs> cockney and all that. And it's just a bit of fun, do you know what yeah, I mean? Of course, of course. Um, it wasn't like an anti Welsh thing, it was just a bit of a laugh. Um, oh, I don't know, we looked at his seat. Um, pardon? It did look a bit serious. Oh, right. He was acting, <laughs> of course. Um, but no, but look, the, the, there's a new Foot Soldier film coming out. Is uh, it? Yeah, called Take Two Days of Blood. Um, the title may change, and that's He's savage, isn't he? And that's uh, that's really a Tate's uh, story. So it's it's another 
spin-off with Tate. Um, and that comes out in October. But you'll be in it again? Because you was no, in... No, I'm not in it. No, at no, all? No, so me and Roland aren't in this one. Um, and But they brought other actors in. So there's Jeff Bell's in this one. Um, and, and I think the reason why they've done this... Tommy Hatcher. Uh, is, Shout out to Jeff Bell. Uh, but I think, I think the reason they've done it is because um, they... They 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 want to do this foot soldier I beefer, which is going to be like a, like foot soldier my bear, where it's me and Roland and obviously Craig and everybody else, and I think they just decided that you know yeah. let's get everyone excited about it, um and and you know they want to do a reboot they want to do foot soldier millennium which is the guys are dead this is the new guys they want to do you know potentially foot soldier in space uh, they want to do. Foot soldier undead, where where we're all zombies, right? <laughs> but 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 genuinely, look, um, the amount of <laughs> I'm mean, we'll laugh in a bit. Yeah, but 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 genuinely, look, um, the amount of I mean, we're laughing about it, but genuinely, these things, these are things have been have been talked. Well, about. I did see you were fucking the Star Wars crew the other day, so that's where the idea came. Probably was it? No, to, to, be, <laughs> to, to be honest, um, I think you know, foot soldier to school years were there at school taking people to dinner money. I mean, there's a lot of, mm. um, you know. Ideas that, that sound silly, right? But, you know, it could be getting made. So, yeah. you know, we're laughing about it now, but, you know, in, you don't know in what's two gonna come years' the time, you could be watching Foot Soldier Undead. <laughs> Happy days. <laughs> what um the relationship with you and, um, I think I keep forgetting his name, Craig on the film, Craig Rafi plays. What's his real name? Sorry. Avala Manukian. Yeah. Is your relationship like that out of, out of work? Yeah, as I, mean, well? I mean, the thing is, um, with Craig Fedbras and with Roland, we're all we're all just like lads, you know what I mean. So we all have a laugh. So I've seen know. the video. Jeez, yeah. I can't. Is it? Yeah. And 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 it's that thing where we're all mates, and um, you know if you can. Go, and that's the other thing which people don't know. You know, it's like we're all mates. We can work in a film and earn money together, and go to my bar or we can go to West. I mean, that foot soldier origin was shot in COVID, right? So everybody's banged up in their houses. They can't go out. It's a fucking miserable time, right? We go on a film set for four weeks making a movie. You know, where do I sign? Do you know what I mean? It was, it wasn't, I didn't even have to think about it. It was like, absolutely. You know, um, I was hanging out with my mates, making a movie. And um, the film's obviously gone out, you know, I had the biggest cinema release out of all of them. Amazon released it. And Hulu in America's released mm. it. So that's never happened, you know. So I enjoyed that. Very happy about that. It's good for my career as an actor as well. Yeah, well, the, yeah, because that was like a real, was that probably one of the first ever films you've done when it was a real main focal point is yourself, like as, as being yeah. the main character? Yeah, I mean, I've been in, I've played obviously lead roles before and I've played sort of second leads or whatever, but, you know, that was the first film that it was just me, you know, as the main character, which was great, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think it'd be funny, you know, with the, the one with Tate though, because even on those ones, you are kind of in them you know, somewhere in the films, like, so that'd be interested. Um, what, what would be your dream role as a, would you like to go back into EastEnders or was you killed off in EastEnders? I don't know. No, I wasn't killed, killed off. off I mean, I mean, to be honest, um, I think as an actor, I think all, all you want to do is work on good stuff, whether it's TV, whether it's film. Mm. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very busy at the moment with developing stuff um, and putting films together. So we've got loads of stuff that we're working on that we're getting, you know, that we get TV shows, mm. films. Um, and with all these things, you know, nobody sees the amount of time that, that goes yeah, behind the scenes. And uh, uh, so, so we're always spinning multiple plates and waiting, obviously, for things to go into production, yeah. get funding. Um, but, you know, in, 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 in the meantime, I've obviously been, I've got involved in the Volker brand. Um, I've got involved in uh, another company called Dark Horse Films, which is um, a digital film studio which is going to make digital content and then monetize digital yeah. assets from the films. How would you crypto go? Um, with, with the crypto, again, we launched that in Some April. Crypto, it? Literally, we, we, yeah, we, we come up with the idea. So the idea was we have a digital film studio. We do NFTs. We do the crypto. But obviously, we launched it in April, and that was when the war started. And everybody literally ran for the hills. Yeah, obviously, the whole okay. market crashed. So it was probably the worst time. But the thing is, again, those um, failures and you know, yeah. But the thing is, like you know, we've we the, the company Dark Horse, which we set up, yeah, had been acquired by a Canadian company, and we're now trading on the Canadian stock exchange. So that is going to be interesting because obviously, when we start, we've already signed a deal with 
crypto.com. Yeah. And we've got free collections that we're going to be doing with, with digitalizing assets. And uh, obviously we're going to be announcing this in due course, but there's a lot of things that are going to be happening on that front. And again, Brilliant. it's a new thing that um, I've never done. Um, and we've also been approached by several companies who are actually building things in the metaverse where they want to basically oh, incorporate cool. films. Or oh, Rise of the Foot Soldier metaverse. No, no but they want, to inco- <laughs> incorporate, they want to incorporate films in the metaverse where you can watch them and then you can actually go into them and you can interact with the characters. I mean, that's the conversations I've been having the last three months are mind blowing. And I'm next sitting time. here thinking, and, and again, it's, you know, out of what I do, you get all these opportunities. Yeah. So, you know, you don't know which one is going to be a success, which one's going to be a, but you have to have a go at all of these things. And you yeah, know, see, no, see where you end up. And I think that's how you will become successful. You've got to try these things. You've got to be optimistic. Hate those people who, when you, give an idea or a dream yeah. or something you fancy on a venture and they say, oh, but this is the problem. That's the problem. Listen, I'm a tr- I've always been a trier and they say God loves a trier, but <laughs> I've, I've always had a go at everything and I've always given 100%. And, um, you know, as as a sort of, you know, grafter, you yeah. know, yeah. You, can, you, can, you can put in 100% and sometimes you get a result, sometimes you don't. But I think you just keep coming back to the table and you keep going, you know, so... There is something I want to uh, nitpick at you as well. Uh, it's to do with the film industry. You know, we never heard. Yeah. Did you produce that? Yeah. Okay. This is interesting right. because like, obviously you was talking about um, rolling with the nines was the first one. You did have kidhood. You had adulthood. Noel Clark, he's been in the, uh, you know, he's been on media quite a lot. A few podcasts he's done recently coming out and stuff. I don't know if you know him, but. Yeah, worked with him. Yeah. He said something about the, and never heard how that was meant to have been, I think Deacon was looking for a film to be made and you took on that film. He said like, what was it like with like, is there anything you could like say up on that subject of what he was saying about Teddy Stone took the film? No, I met, and- I met, I met, uh, I met now on Doghouse. We worked together and you know, I've, I've always thought he was a decent guy. You know, I've never, all those things that people were saying about him, I've never personally seen any of it. So, you know, I was quite shocked when, when those things come out. Um, but, um, we worked on Doghouse together and he, my daughter um, was a big fan of Noel Clark. So she said, so I said, oh, why don't you come on the set and meet him? So he made a fuss of her and she was going, oh dad, you know, I'm 16th birthday's coming up. Oh. Would he come? And I, and I said to Noel, I said, look, <clears throat> I said, no, we've, you, you've entertained my daughter on the film set and we, we're mates, but I don't want to, you think I'm taking liberties, right? But, She's asked if you go to a birthday party, she's 16, you know, I don't mind picking you up and having a dinner, but I said it would just be really amazing for her. And he went, mate, it's done. Oh, okay. Then he rings me up like a week before and he goes, I'm bringing a mate with me. I was like, who's that? And he went, Adam Deaton. And I said, who's that? Because I, I hadn't watched Kid Up. Um, and he went, obviously, Kid Up, she know who he is, but don't tell her he's coming. So oh. we went to dinner and then, uh, and then he, he was pitching me this thing. He goes, tell, I've got this idea. Me and I've been talking about doing a spoof hood movie, another hood, this and the other. Send you the script. I went, all right, brilliant. And then we went to the party, made my daughter's night. She was like, I can't believe you. And they were emceeing and everything, and getting everyone excited. Um, and um, you know, and then I think a few months later, something happened between Noel and Adam, and I don't know what it was, but they fell out. And um, at that by that time, we'd already the got, wheels of got, got, got the script going and all the rest of it. And Noel was like, look, you know, I don't want to, me and you are mates, but I don't like him, right? What he's done is fucking out of order. And I, he didn't really go into what it was, but he said, I'm not dealing with him. And I was like, okay. So we went off and made the film. Obviously it was big success. Um, the, um, I think it took two million at the box office. Um, Adam Deacon won a BAFTA off of that film, right? So it's annoying that I didn't as a producer, but, um, you know, we give him all the tools, you know, we had a, a guy who sort of sat with him and helped him direct the film and, you know, Brother Valve, who was the distributor, they put in um, money and then we raised some money yeah. for it. Um, you had a cameo appearance in that as well, didn't you? Yeah. The chef. No, no, I was the deck collector. Oh, deck collector, sorry, yeah. But it was good fun. But um, again, you know, that was, uh, that was a film that, you know, again, you know, Revolver, who was the distribution company and 
the production company yeah. that we was working with. Of Ruffs, yeah. They had massive problems. Um, I think probably a year after that, and they went out of business, which was, yeah. you know, really bad. Um, and that's why there hasn't been another hood too. Yeah. Because um, it got messy, and you know they owed Coots a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. And uh, other people. So. Well, Noel sounds like a lovely guy, though. To hear that, like you know, Listen, you as I said, you know, look, I've, I've known him for years. As I said, you know, I've never seen anything inappropriate go on. But I, I wasn't. I'm not his mate. I don't hang yeah, around yeah. with him every day. But you know, when all that stuff came out, I was, I was shocked. Yeah, by yeah, yeah. I was yeah. shocked. What's um, the, the film in industry now like? Obviously, we've got Netflix. We've got all these streaming sites. Is it getting harder to, to, to make it? I think, I think it is. I think, um, you know, it's, it's a lot harder to, um, to, to, you know, I think especially in the current climate, I think um, lots of people are, become, you know, people want to be in and out of stuff. So I think, you know, if you talk to anybody about investing now, people want to know how long it's going to be. Um, and obviously the problem with film is you can't give anyone a timeline because yeah, when you're making a film, you know, I could come up with an idea for a film today. It could be a year or two years before it gets made. And then obviously in a year, two years, um, you know, there could be something in the film that offends people. You know, it could there could be an actor in it that's misbehaved and has been cancelled. So now people don't want to... doubles. So there's, there's so many... Yeah. It's like literally a minefield. Minefield, and, and, yeah. and also with a diversity thing... When you're making something, you're thinking, well, I know what the diversity is now, but in in a year's time, is it going to go the other way? Is it going to get worse? It, yeah, what's going to happen? So you have to kind of, I think if anybody, if, if, if you had a crystal ball, you'd know what to do. But that's the excitement about making films because you come up with an idea and obviously you believe in the idea and then you execute the idea. But yeah. you don't actually know, right? When we made Rise of the Foot Soldier Origins, all the cinemas were shut. We didn't know. Was is it going to come out? Is it going to be on Netflix? Is it going to be a digital play? You know, there was no shops open. There was no cinemas open. So we made that film without knowing how it's going to come out. But but that's what I'm saying. You know, sometimes you have to throw the dice and take the risk, and sometimes it pays off. Sometimes it doesn't. But that's the excitement I think about. And I think a lot of people invest in films because they want to support the arts because they like the films they want to be on the film set sometimes people want to be an exec producer so they invest because they want to have their name up in lights yeah. or they want to be in the film doing a cameo or they want their daughter or their son mm. in it or their wife in it so i think people have different reasons for doing it um give me a shout then for a cameo yeah if the next taffy if you yeah. need it if you need a taffy you've got a great voice i mean you, you yeah. i actually thought you was welsh when i walked in right you've actually been putting that on haven't yeah you? <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, Terry! It's been it's been lovely talking to you. What's, what's, what have you got planned in the in, in the near future? Well, as I said, you know we're we're busy with the dark horse stuff and digitalizing his assets, <clears throat> and we've got a few film projects that um, we're putting together now. And uh, with me, I never announce anything until it's actually happening because if I say, "Oh yeah, I'm doing a film about this," I'm doing a film about that, people will go, oh, "Great!" And then it's like, well, "When's it coming?" And it's like, "I oh, will." We're waiting on this, we're waiting on that, but we have got some amazing content. Like yeah. really good stuff that's mind blowing, but it's just making sure we get the right director because what's happening now in air business is you've got to think about the package, right? Because the UK, if you make a film in, in the UK and it just comes out in the UK, you're not going to get enough money to, to yeah, yeah, yeah. so you've got to think it's got to be international and you've got to think, yeah, it's got to work on multiple levels. So um, when you're thinking about making a film, you've got to think about, the director's got to be somebody people know. The actors have got to be people that have got fan bases that people know. And, you know... Not just in the UK. Yeah, so... so so the bit, But I think the good things about what we're doing is we're, with this digital studio, we're basically looking to create a way where we can monetize films instantly. So rather than having to wait till the film's finished and then releasing the film and then waiting for the distribution statement, and obviously... You know, you might sell it to like 15 places in the world or 100 places in the world. Yeah. But then all of those places are all accounting to you at different times. They're all sending you statements at different times. Some of them don't account to you, then you've got to chase them. Some of them go out of business. So you've got all this stuff going on. And um, it's it's like you're always waiting. And like, you know, with, with a lot of these streaming platforms, if they do a deal with you, it depends on the license period. If it's 18 months, they say, well, we're going to pay you this much money, but we're going to oh, spread it out over 18 months. 
Or if it's three years, we're going to spread it over three years. So you're sitting there going, well, I know I've got this much money, but I've got to wait three years before it comes in. And if you're obviously an investor, you've got to wait as well, right? So, so you know, so, game, so, yeah. so, so the reason we come up with the Dark Horse Digital Studio was because we said, if we can monetize it as we're making it, and then when it's fi finished, That's we can nice. actually say to people, you can actually buy it from us directly. So you cut out all these middlemen. Yeah, yeah. And obviously we get paid instantly. We haven't got to wait. So we, we've been we've been doing this for a year now and we're getting very close to actually yeah. getting everything technically right. And when we have got that technically right, then we're going to do a film and put it through the model to, test to it, demonstrate yeah. it works. Yeah. And then once we've got it and we can say, well, that's what it cost. That's what we got back. That's you the time You take scale. over the game with that. Then everybody around the world can go, well, I'll carry on doing what I do. Or, I and also, I think, you know, a lot of these streaming platforms now are actually funding content. So they're actually saying we're fund the whole thing. Wow. So, so you know, it's, 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 I think COVID has pushed it more digital, pushed everything digital. Yeah, it, it was um, that. So, so I think, I think, you know, a lot of the stuff that's happening now, that's just the way it's gone. Um, but I think it's good in a way because yeah. if it's digital, um, you know, it's, it's easier to track everything. When you're relying on somebody to press up DVDs and then they put them in shops and they come back, you know, every time a DVD goes to a shop, there's a distribution cost. When the DVD comes back, there's a distribution cost. But if you haven't sold it, you've still got those distribution costs. So when everything's digital, there's only the actual transaction cost. There's not there's not a cost to ship it to a shop. Never looked at it. And then, there's, yeah, so, so <clears throat> in a way, and also... Because everyone's on their phones now. Because we look at digital sometimes. It's a bad thing. We need hard copies. And Listen, I like, very, very I, I like reading books. I like touching things. I, but I'm 52, right? But most people go, I don't want to touch anything. I don't want to carry anything. I just want it on my phone. I want to press the button. Yeah, yeah. And I want to consume it. And then I'm going to move on. And that's just how it's going. And I think um, it's giving everyone an ADHD. But I think, it is, it is. It but is. I, think, I think that's just how it is. But the good news is, for us, when we're releasing a film now and we want to market and advertise it, it's a lot cheaper than it used to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And back then, you know, to, to really get a film out, you'd have to spend a million plus on just marketing. But now you can spend 30, 40, 50, 60 grand and get the same results. Oh, you're so, laughing. You know, so, so, so where people say, well, you know, you haven't got the DVD revenue as much, you know, it's digital, the digital revenue's not as much, the Netflix, blah, blah. When you actually look at it, the actual cost of market and advertising will drop. So it's all like realigning itself. And obviously the cinemas um, are, are becoming, not not the smaller ones and the IMAXs, but the multiplexes that have got like 10 or 12 screens, they're having a tough time. Yeah. Because people just aren't going to them. So and there's not enough content. It's a massive so. shame, yeah. Yeah. But, um, but you know, out of uh, change comes opportunity. So I think you just yeah. have to look at it and go, okay, this has changed. How do we deal with it? How do we go through yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Would you um, would you ever do, because you was a boxer, you're training, would you ever do that celebrity boxing or anything like that? Have you ever thought about it? Do you know something? Who knows? Um, I mean, the thing is... I'm, Teddy V. Carlton. I have been... <laughs> Teddy V. Carlton. I'm sorry, did you have... No, I mean, do you know, do you know something? That could be interesting. But... Uh, there we are, but, Central but Club. The, but the... But the, but the but in all seriousness, like, you know, I think when you look at... Um, when you look at celebrity boxing matches, I think if you're in your 30s or 40s, it's okay. But I think, you know, if you're 50, 50 plus, right, careful. you're going to get punched in the, in, the, in the edge. You know, there's there's a chance you could end up getting brain damage or getting knocked out or, or seriously injured. So I I, I think, um, I think for, for me, I'd, I'd go. Yeah, I'd, 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 I've actually been approached to do it, right? And, I bet, yeah. And, and look, you know, I... I I might, I might be an actor and I might be 52, but I can, I can absolutely have it. Um, but the thing is, I don't know if I need to uh, get into a boxing ring and, and beat someone up and say, everyone, oh, look, you know, I'm, I'm not that, you know, yeah, I love yeah, and not a fire. I love and not a fire. If I have to fight, I will, but I'm not, I don't go looking for yeah, it. Yeah. It's not my, you know, I think anybody who goes around looking for it or, or fighting for the sake of it, I, I, I don't get that. You know, if you have to fight, you have to fight, but you don't need, there's nothing macho, you know, you go out and uh, smack someone in the mouth and then you get arrested and you get a criminal record <laughs> and you can't go to America, you, can't, you haven't got a job. So yeah, where's the true. value in that? Do you know what I mean? There's no value. I think if you're, 
if if you got nothing to lose, then fair enough. But mm. I think when you got something to lose, why would you? You know, I always think about, you know. Yeah, you th you always thinking about that consequence, yeah. and some people don't, do they? And yeah. it's a dangerous world because of it. You get Tony <laughs> Tucker's in the world. <laughs> Teddy, honestly, mate, it's been yeah. a real pleasure. I need to shake your hand. Yeah. You too, mate. Thanks for having us on. Brilliant. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Um, what we normally do, a couple of words of wisdom out to our, 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 our people who watch. Right. Um, maybe if you've got some last words to people, something positive, maybe of, of yeah. the experience in your life of, of, of what's got you successful. I think maybe. the most important thing is don't be a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I was going to say, that's, give us a Tony Tucker. That's actually probably the best advice, you know. Um, but, but you know, all joking apart, I, I just think, look, whatever you do in life, um, people don't like competition, right? Mm. But the reality is there's enough for everybody, right? And, you know, in life, you know, you can walk around holding grudges and get upset by things. But what's the point? Do you know what I mean? It's sort of like it's absolutely a complete waste of energy. And I just think in life, I think the older you get, the less tolerant you become of fools. But then you also sort of think, you know, if somebody, you know, is saying something I don't like or is acting in a way I don't like, well, I just don't talk to them. I don't need them in my life. They don't, it's zero, you know, there's, there's zero value for me. Um, so I always think, you know, just, just, you know, there's an old saying in there, you know, walk softly and carry a big, no, walk quietly and carry a big stick. And the thing is, you don't need to tell everybody about, you know, what you've got or how well you're doing or whatever. I, genuinely, I just make films. I have a good time, do a bit of acting. I, if there's some other business stuff I can do, I'm always interested in opportunities, and that's really me. But yeah. I think I think being humble is important. I think working hard has been important. And, you know, if you fail, you just got to go again. You know, there's no point crying about your failures, you know. There's, there's, you know, it's not going to... It's not going to, if, if you dwell in the past as well, I think that's also a bad thing because you're focusing on what happened. Yeah. But it's like, it's happened. You, you can't change it. You know, yeah, there's no I magic wand to... see a lot of that in addiction. People can't move on with their lives because of the shit they've done. Listen, if they bring time travel back, I will definitely be getting in that TARDIS yeah. and I will definitely be going back and f fucking around with things that I've done in the past, which mistakes I've made, right? But I also think that when you make a mistake... When you do someone a favour and they don't repay it, or when when you know anybody treats you badly, I think you do actually sort of think, okay, well, you know, yeah, that's yeah. made me, you know, I'd rather people show their true colours than think they're actual friends or think that they're yeah. people that are going to be of value to me. Do you know what I mean? I think I'm as a friend and as a business partner or colleague, I add value. Do you know what I mean? But I expect the people I'm working with. To be the same, yeah. do you know what I mean? So I'm not asking them to do any more or any less than what I'm doing, but I think if you do work with like-minded people, you can achieve anything you want. Thank you very much, Teddy. I'll leave it on that, yep, I think. Perfect. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Um, go and follow Teddy on his uh, social media. Well, you, you want everything, Instagram, Twitter. I am, yeah. Yeah? yeah. But go and show your support as well with the vodka. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, anybody goes on to my you know, social media profiles and they go to my link tree, they can actually get a 10% discount. You can't, on, what, on, 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 on a bottle of on that, yeah. any 10, yes. 10, 10%, 10% on any 10? And that ain't bad, is it? That's beautiful. That's, that, you can never say that Terry doesn't give you anything. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, this is the last episode of us in, of the day in Hope Cottage. I hope you, you were sorry about some of the noises. We are in a, like, it's like a rehab type of place. But uh, you never told me it was a rehab place. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Takes me to all the best places. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him, Ter. He, he, he knocked door number 69. You went to the wrong house, didn't you? I did. I went, I went and, and the guy was like, Why are you here? And I said, oh, I'm beating Cullen. He's going, Who's Cullen? I was going, Doing a podcast. No, not here, mate. And I was like, You can. <laughs> I was like, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no. On that note, like, um, thank you, Teddy. Oh, thank you. Um, hopefully, we'll work with you one day again. Yeah. Uh, if you need a cameo guy whilst talking good looking in a, in a Welsh film. guy yeah just have to lose a bit of weight do we need to take any pictures or anything or yeah. let me finish that. oh sorry <laughs> I thought we were done you know thanks I mean? guys this guy goes on and stay. on and on <laughs> <laughs> stay central the central club